Welcome to Half Hour of Heterodoxy. Conversations with scholars and authors. Ideas from diverse viewpoints and perspectives. My name is Corey Clark. I am the Director of Academic Engagement for Heterodox Academy, and I am hosting today's episode with guest Megan Daum. Megan is a columnist for Medium, an adjunct faculty in the MFA writing program at Columbia University School of the Arts, and author of five books, one of which we will be discussing today, The Problem with Everything. Um, I think I can also designate Megan the queen of one liners. <laughs> the book has a lot of good ones. Um, and Heterodox Academy read The Problem with Everything for a recent book club. Uh, so now we have Megan here to discuss the book, and I will include some questions from our book club participants in the interview. Hi, Megan. Welcome to the show. Hi, Corey. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Our pleasure. Um, so we're talking about problems here today. Uh, the book is a bit of left on left criticism, a reflection on how modern liberalism or progressivism, even from the perspective of a committed liberal, um, seems to have perhaps gotten a bit extreme. But the main criticism is of contemporary feminism. So what is the problem if there is one main problem with modern feminism and you describe it as wave four um, and particularly in contrast to more old school feminism? This is very much my own problem. The book is it's many things, but at its root, it's really a self interrogation. It's not a polemic. I'm trying to figure all of this stuff out. I'm trying to figure all of this stuff out and invite my reader to think alongside me as I as I sort through these generational divides and and the various conflicts um, of the present moment. The problem with fourth wave feminism to me is the way it's become more a series of memes than uh, than a set of coherent ideas. And I know that's like easy for me to say as as a Gen Xer, and you know, I I was I grew up with second wave feminism. My mother was like a seventies feminist. Um, and then I came of age in the eighties and the nineties. And there was this kind of like riot girl, uh, kind of post punk sort of aesthetic around feminism. So, um, it, it may be that I am bringing a kind of older person's eye, uh, into all of this. And when I look at social media and I look at the way a lot of these ideas have sort of metabolized, um, I am seeing a lot of like, just snarky retorts and really just glib ways of talking about things um, instead of substantive ideas. And unfortunately, a lot of it has gotten boiled down to um, punching up at men and assuming that criticizing men and talking about things like toxic masculinity and complaining about things like mansplaining and manspreading is okay because men are by default uh, more powerful than women. And so therefore, it's okay to kind of slam them um, as if we are automatically of a lower class. And that to me seems uh, inherently paradoxical and inherently contradictory. And and so what was really driving a lot of my inquiry around feminism in the book is, is looking at, at these contradictions and a lot of the hypocrisies in terms of the way women talk about their own power and, and own up to their own agency. Yeah, so this is related to, um, I think throughout the book, you mentioned a couple of places that women in some ways seem sort of desirous of victimhood status, or they're like, um, sort of being viewed as children instead of women. And I'm curious, what do you see as the primary motivation here? If women are desiring to be seen as victims, what are they getting from this? You know, the question of what are we getting from this is one that I ask myself every day. I really don't know. Um, you know, and I do want to be careful about speaking in these generalizations. I mean, you start talking about not you, but one starts talking about victim culture and grievance culture and this sort of thing. And it's very easy to start to sound like somebody on the right or somebody who's making very reductive uh, criticisms and generalities about this whole sort of gestalt. But, you know, it's funny because I grew up, like I said, in the in the 70s and the 80s, and, and I at no time as a little girl, as a teenager, saw myself as anything other than equal to boys. If anything, the girls were doing better than the boys. The girls got better grades. Um, you know, if, if the boys were getting called on more in class, I always thought it was because the teacher was like so grateful for any boy raising his hand <laughs> at all or, or not raising his hand um, that she would sort of like that, you know, just kind of 
give him, uh, you know, give him all the space that he needed. So, uh, you know, by the time I got to college, there were more women going to college than than men. There were uh, slightly more women in law school. When I got to be a young adult, there were more women buying real estate, more men were living with their parents, this sort of thing. <laughs> so fast forward a couple of decades, probably right around 2014 or so, I started to notice that at the very moment when women had so clearly surpassed men um, in so many spheres, not at the very, very top, I'm not talking about CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, I'm not talking about you know tech billionaires in Silicon Valley, but by and large, um, women had just surpassed men on every level. And that coincided with this sort of default premise in the conversation about how men had all this power and women were suddenly more oppressed than ever and in danger and being spoken over and being overlooked. And I thought that's curious. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So I wanted to ponder that the question of what we're getting out of it. All I keep coming back to is a sense of solidarity, a sense of affiliation. I think people are lonely and seeking connection and for whatever reason, social media makes it really easy to align ourselves around um, complaints and, and grievances. And so here we are. Yeah. And if that's how you get support and that's how you get like responses and clicks and yeah. followers, then I suppose you would want to do something like that. Um, so if if modern feminism is sort of choosing uh, the wrong battles in a way, where do you see a place for feminism today? What what would be the worthy causes of feminism in modern society? Well, our job is not done yet. There are lots of ways that that women uh that, that women's rights are, are still not what they should be. I mean, reproductive rights are in peril um, in many, many states. Um, and people are are fighting that. Um, that's, that's certainly not like a battleground that's been forgotten. But I think that's a really good example. Um, you know, this whole question of women's rights uh, overseas and just sort of civil rights, you know, hum- humanitarian issues more broadly, that's really run into conflict with this kind of cultural appropriation conversation. So are we allowed to criticize um, women being veiled? Are we allowed to criticize things like um, female genital mutilation? Because doing so is asserting our sort of Western imperialism and that's therefore that's not right. So I think that like people who are sensitive to these issues and people who 20 years ago would have been approaching some of these things from a primarily feminist point of view are now having to reckon with um, kind of critical race theory approaches to these topics, and it just becomes really, really muddled. Um, but you know, I one thing I keep coming back to, just in my life, and I certainly came back to in the book, is this idea: like men, you know, so much of what I see women complaining about in terms of men, it's just men being stupid and silly and <laughs> not having any power at all. Uh, and so it seems to me that you know the way that we sort of put men in their place and put ourselves in our own rightful place is to is to laugh at them um, and to shame them, make them see how stupid they look when they don't take women seriously. Um, and and instead, I think too often we sort of don't take our, don't take ourselves seriously. So that kind of bothers me. Yeah, one thing I think you kind of mentioned is that a lot of the time these aren't systemic problems, they're just individual males that are causing problems. And so to point the finger at, you know, society as a whole might be missing the target in some cases. Yeah, you know, there's this whole idea of toxic masculinity. And I have a section in the book that's pretty controversial. I think it pissed a lot of people off. Um, I mean, a lot of the (laughs) book pissed a lot of people off, but this section, perhaps specifically, uh, where I talk about the idea of, um, of toxic femininity. So if we're going to have uh, a whole sort of dialectic or a whole kind of you know, ecosystem around this idea of of what men do that are in, that it, are inherently what are inherently male qualities that are also you know inherently toxic qualities. We have to be able to talk that way about women. I mean, when it comes to emotional manipulation, gaslighting, you know, that's a term that's arisen over the last couple of years. Uh, women tend to be much more adept at that sort of stuff than than men. You know, I, I talk in the book how I had a student, I was teaching grad students, and 
um, the, the term gaslighting came up and we sort of said like, well, what does that mean? This was maybe three years ago. And young woman, very bright young woman who I really adored as a student said, oh, well, gaslighting, that's that thing that men do to women. And to her, that was the definition of the word. And I just thought, my gosh, like, it, you know, when it comes to um, being being devious and, and manipulative and sort of operating on a whole sort of, you know, cognitive, emotional level uh, that a lot of men can't hear, women are so much better at that. <laughs> women are much better gaslighters than men. Um, but for some reason, we're, we're not able to own that. Yeah. So there are some double standards there in terms of what you can criticize. And relatedly, I think there are double standards in terms of like who is allowed to do the criticizing. So you described in the in the introduction um, a friend advising you to write about feminism, saying, um, write about feminism because as a straight, cisgendered, able-bodied, heteronormative white chick, it's the only thing available to you anyway. Um, and I think the implication here is that perhaps only women are allowed to criticize feminism or things like the Me Too movement, or at least um, they're the only ones who can get away with it. So I'm wondering, what do you think of the costs and benefits of like either excluding men from these kinds of conversations or requiring them to tread very right, very lightly if they're trying to talk about these sort of things? Well, this is this whole standpoint epistemology, right? So, you know, especially over the last few years, this is this is something that I'm sure, you know, has been prevalent in academia for decades, but has come into the mainstream in the last couple of years. So the the premise is that you're not allowed to to critique anything or have an opinion about anything unless you are part of the group uh that or the I heard on nothing nothing about mm, nothing about me without me oh really oh that's good yeah <laughs> um so so yeah i did not feel that i i was really able to speak about uh anything other than feminism. Although I, I think we should just back up for a second here, because in terms of this particular book, I would just, I would read, I, I can't emphasize this enough. I'm not an academic. I'm not like a policy wonk. I'm an essayist. I'm an observer of the world and I'm a sort of observer of my own experience. And so what I wanted to do was really, really write a book that on every page was wrestling with these ideas. There's nothing conclusive here. It's about my own cognitive dissonance and the cognitive dissonance that I think a lot of people feel. So I, I have to say, I started to notice um, this kind of memification of feminism uh, around 2014, 2015 or so. This was around the time that Emma Sulkowitz at Columbia University was carrying her mattress around, protesting um, the fact that her, the, the, student she accused of sexually assaulting her had not been expelled. Um, and so there was just suddenly a lot of female rage being expressed on social media and digital media platforms like Jezebel, uh, places, you know, online magazines like like Slate and even the, the mainstream publications that had once been sort of reliably in the middle were defaulting to the left in a really noticeable way. So I started to notice that and I started to notice it mostly around feminism. Uh, and this was well before anybody was thinking about Donald Trump. Uh, it, mm -hmm. you know, by the time I started writing the book, I think I officially started writing it in like early 2016. I assumed that Hillary Clinton would be the next president. Um, I, I thought that like the world could handle a sort of gentle razzing of, of third and fourth wave feminism. And it was really going to be about the generational divides. It was going to be a Gen Xer tries to sort of look at the differences between her mother's version of feminism and and younger women's version of it. So so that happened. So I, I wrote a version of this book and it was going to be called You Are Not a Badass because the <laughs> this notion of the badass was everywhere. And again, this gets to your your earlier question, like, what is it about this kind of self infantilization? Like I noticed that the badass moniker would be applied to anybody, you know, any woman who sort of got out of bed every morning and, and <laughs> went to work and, and did her job and paid her rent on time. It, it, the, the idea was that it's such a struggle to be a woman in this world and face down the patriarchy at every turn that just doing the bare minimum makes you a badass. So the, <laughs> the book was going to be called, you are not a badass. And then we all know what happened. Hillary Clinton lost the election and there was suddenly the, the, this whole sort of phenomenon of um, outrage had broken open. It was not just about women. It was about race. It was about 
um, power, power hierarchies. Um, and it was really convoluted in a lot of ways. Um, but it was also so much broader than, than just the women's woman question. And I really started to notice that what was happening was that there was a conversational chokehold in the culture. We could not, there were certain things, certain questions that were really, we were not allowed to ponder, uh, because they were sort of too nuanced or too complicated and too easily hijacked by the wrong side. We needed all hands on deck to fight Trumpism. Uh, hashtag resistance was really the only the only path to be on, but nobody really could agree with with what that meant. So I noticed that there was something much bigger going on than than the question of like women being silly on social media. There was just uh, a much larger refusal to engage. Uh, with ideas in an intellectually honest way. So the book really became more about that. And that's why it is the problem with everything. It's not just the problem with feminism. Right. Um, I think this is a good time to talk about Title IX <laughs> and the restoration of due process in campus proceedings in cases of sexual misconduct. And you talked about it a little bit in your book, but this is now relevant today, even more so. Um, so I'm wondering if you're, it's your view that because this is happening under the Trump administration, that liberals will not be on board with these changes. Um, and if so, is there a progressive case to be made for these Title IX changes? Is there a progressive case to be made for the rollbacks of the of the Obama for yeah, restoring due process? Yeah, well, I think um, there is. Um, I'm not a fan of Betsy DeVos, but uh, a broken clock is right twice a day. And in this case, I think she was absolutely right to roll back um, those policies. That was a so I mean, I'm assuming a lot of our listeners know this, but in case they don't, in 2011, the Obama administration uh, sent out this infamous dear colleague letter to all the universities, uh, that were receiving federal funding, which is most of them, private or public, saying that, uh, if in cases where a complaint of sexual assault or misconduct, uh, is, is made, you have to follow these certain guidelines, uh, or you're going to risk losing your federal funding. And those guidelines were really, um, that they favored the accuser to a degree that it was as if due process had been um, uh, obliterated in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and, you know, they were followed sort of haphazardly. Every every institution sort of ended up making up its own rules in a way. And uh, anyway, we don't have to get really and, you know, terribly in the weeds on that. But it's uh, interesting that that happened during um, not only a Democratic administration, but uh, the administration of a beloved president. I mean, somebody that liberals, it wasn't just that, like, he was on their side, like they, he, Obama was a, was a hero. And so I, I think that it's, it's an example of something that really nobody looked at very closely because they just assumed that it was the right thing. And so, you know, when Betsy DeVos comes in as education secretary under Trump, she says, well, I'm looking at this and I'm going to roll these back. These are, these are not, this violates every sort of due process principle we have as a, as a country. And there was a notice and comment period and there was a lot of discussion around it. And she ended up doing just that. And I think that, you know, if it had been reversed and if the original policy had come from a conservative administration, all the liberals would have screamed and then would have been happy when a Democrat came and rolled them back. You know, it's an example of a refusal to be intellectually honest, like in, instead of actually looking at what was going on, the way these rules were being misapplied and and really the there were unintended consequences that were pretty severe they just assumed um that it was all politicized and 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 that the the left was was right about it and the right was wrong about it and in this case i i don't agree yeah it's unfortunately sort of impossible counterfactual to imagine how would you have felt about this um if this was happening during obama and like the the scripts were reversed, but you just can't run that thought experiment well, and, or people you know, have a hard time running it. Anyway. And it's amazing that the ACLU, you know, in recent months and years has come out um, against Duvas's rollbacks. They have come out in favor of these often mm -hmm. draconian uh, policies. And it just, it flies in the face of everything the ACLU has stood for. And Nadine Strawson, who was head of the ACLU for a long, long time, has publicly said that that she disagrees with the current position and 
you know, but in a, in a more, you know, the, the ACLU that, that most of us uh, know and love or, you know, grew up respecting um, would never in a million years support the kind of, uh, the kind of um, policies that, that the Obama administration uh, set, set forth. And, you know, by the way, Joe Biden was hugely instrumental in that. So <laughs> here he is. A little bit uh, of irony. <laughs> yeah. So, and again, it's so, uh, so much of it to me, it, it almost felt like virtue signaling. I mean, I mean, I loved Obama as much as anybody and I hate to say it, but there was a lot of virtue signaling going on in that administration. And we just didn't happen to use the, the term virtue signaling at that time. Mm-hmm. Even, even good leaders can make mistakes too. Yeah. And even good leaders can just be sort of shallow about things and, and get away with it. It's because we love them. Mm-hmm. Um, so a question from one of our book club participants was um, that you signal you're a feminist throughout your book by stating your support for abortion as a right. And what do you think of pro-life feminists and their place in the new culture war? Well, I think that the pro-life position is entirely understandable on an intellectual level. Uh, If you think that abortion is murder, it would make sense to fight tooth and nail to keep it uh, illegal, to make it not available. Um, Again, it's, it's really, it's, it, in the same way that it bothered me that the women's March um, in the wake of the Trump election was so much centered around women. It, it was as if like, well, only women are upset that that Trump has been elected. Like only women are worried about the state, the state of the of the world. And somehow Trump is only a threat to women. He's not a threat to the entire world and social norms and and everybody. It, it so in the same way, it, it sort of bothered me that Trump resistance got wrapped up in uh, women's rights and women's oppression. It bothers me that kind of you know the the, the woman that. The, the discussion around feminism is so often uh, wrapped up in, in reproductive rights. But I also think it's really important to distinguish reproductive rights from abortion, because I think that a lot of people who are pro-life are not necessarily anti-birth control um, or anti, you know, very easy access to birth control. But unfortunately, because it gets so politicized, we're not even allowed to have like a, a nuanced discussion and we're not even allowed to sort of slice these things into, into the, you know, the finely tuned categories that they are. So, so yeah, but again, you know, I guess what I would say is that, well, I know this is what I would say that women are not a monolith. We are not a community. Um, it's kind of like every time you say something like, well, the black community or the gay community or the trans community, that's so insulting because, uh, you know, identity or innate biological characteristics or immutable traits, uh, it's not a political position. So I, I think we really have to sort of get away from the idea of women's issues uh, and just really try to see ourselves as, as whole individuals. But I think with social media, um, there's so little incentive for for just getting away from identity categories and there's huge incentive, you know, for reinforcing them. So it's that, that would be a, a, a big ask in, in this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, a related question to that, and maybe this is also related to how a lot of people got angry with you. Um, I noticed that you throughout the book, you often mention, you know, I'm a liberal, but X, or of course, sexual harassment is a huge problem, but why? Um, And this is something I noticed in left on left criticism, where people sort of signal their identity, you know, I'm one of the team, I'm, I'm a liberal as well. But I think maybe we've gone a little too far here. So I'm kind of curious what you think of this as a sort of argumentative strategy to try to get liberals to listen. And do you feel like it has been successful for you? Or are people still angry? Um, and then also, like, is there a side effect of potentially implying that if you weren't liberal, then you wouldn't have a right to be speaking about some of these things? Yeah. So I was a newspaper columnist for over 10 years. I was an opinion columnist at the Los Angeles Times. And there's a thing in opinion writing called the to be sure paragraph, where <laughs> you, know, you have your argument, you sort of you probably open up with some kind of example from the news, from the headlines or some sort of anecdote. And then you you know, sort of try start to make your point, try to make the argument. And then there's always a paragraph 
where you say, to be sure, there are many ways in which I'm wrong. You could say this, right. you could say that. Here's all the ways you could ding me. That said, I am now going to carry on and, and submit my argument. Which so, is hard to do with 700 words. <laughs> well, right. But I mean, it's, and it, so if you're trying to do it in a book, um, there is that tendency to, you know, sort of acquit, try to acquit yourself all the time. I will say um, this book had it had a complicated journey. It had um, a couple of different editors. It had I, I was told um, in some cases for like political reasons or just um, partly. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, every, and I and no, I have no, everything is fine. Like everything, there's no, I have no animosity toward anyone. This is there's nothing like secret about this or there's no it's it's all I, I start and you know I started the book I, I set out to write a very different book than I ended up writing it was going to be a book about about fourth wave feminism from the point of view of a Gen Xer uh, you know in the dawn of the Hillary Clinton administration so mm-hmm. by definition that book was not written but um, yeah I definitely was getting a lot of people saying like you've got to make very clear that you're a feminist and you've got to keep saying it and I have to say, there were definitely there are there are a lot of pages that came out of this book. I, I've I've said this, you know, for every page that ended up in the book, there were probably twenty that got thrown out. I probably wrote eight hundred pages worth of material. This is a really short book. Uh, in the end, so it's very. But very don't write hard. a book. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Is it so? Don't write a book. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it was a really, really hard book to write, and I just think, by definition, when you're trying to write about um, the moment that you're still in, and that moment is really confusing, um, it's not. It's it, the the book is going to be um, a little bit messy. I mean, I would be the first to tell you that, but that's actually by design. I think it would be dishonest to say, here's what's happening in the world. Here's what I think. Here's what needs to happen. This is the problem with everything. This is how we fix it. The end. That, that I, I wouldn't write that kind of book. I really wanted a book that was going to be wrestling with my own sense of inner conflict on, on every page. Um, you know, in terms of like, saying again and again that I'm a feminist. Um, I probably wouldn't do that this time, but I'm not sure that that's the only reason people are mad at me. People have been mad at me my whole career. I've been writing, I've been publishing for 25 years and they've always gotten mad. Um, but it's interesting because now they get mad without actually reading what I wrote and they used to uh, get mad after having read something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said... Um... I think somewhere even that you're not necessarily particularly seeking truth, but rather nuance. And I sort of like that because, I mean, I, I think as an academic, academic, I think about these things in terms of like, oh, we're trying to reach the truth. But so often the truth is it, it's impossible now, if not forever. Um, and whatever the truth is, it's going to be really complicated and not something that you can state in a sort of straightforward fact. So I think the idea of trying just to seek nuance or at least openness to discussing pros and cons of various things, um, if everyone were, were more willing to do it, it would be really helpful for discourse. Yeah. You know, they say there's two sides to every story. That's actually not true. There are four sides. <laughs> there are eight sides. There there are you know infinite numbers of sides. So I think all we can do is encourage some kind of some kind of honest, honest debate. And, you know, one of the things that's really struck me, I, I've been writing controversial pieces since the early mid 1990s. And it used to be that that was the job. So you would write something and it was maybe a little provocative, not gratuitously so, but it was you know, I'm, I'm inviting my reader to think of something in a new way. I really think of, of essays. I think of this, this sort of book, which is not a collection of essays, but this kind of book, it's a suggestion. That's really what it is. It's not, I'm not like, you know, laying down the truth. I'm, I'm making a suggestion. What if we looked at it this way? I'm inviting my reader to, to think with me. So I would do that um, early in my career. And people would get angry. There would be angry letters to the editor. I would maybe see them. Maybe I wouldn't. They would be published in the, in the magazine uh, six weeks later or whatever. And, and I would be on to the next thing. And, and actually 
making readers uh, sort of agitated was the job. Th- that was what got mm-hmm. me another assignment. And something's happened um, in the last five or six years where it's almost like the job of the journalist is just to appease her audience and to to sort of make everybody, you know, remind her audience again and again that we're still on the same side and I'm just going to repeat the obvious thing. And and to me, Mm -hmm. that's boring. That's not why I got into the business. So to the extent that people say like, oh, well, you've, you've changed. And, and, you know, we used to, we we used to, to, you know, love you and look up to you, but now you've betrayed us. That Mm. doesn't actually make any sense to me because I'm not doing anything differently than I ever did. In fact, I'm doing a lot more of the to be sure stuff and I'm bending over backwards a lot harder than I even used to um, just because of this moment that we're in. So it's very, it's a very curious thing. Yeah. It is interesting. Kind of like, either agree with us 100% or you lose our support. You cannot deviate even a little bit from my own personal yeah, and views. The, I think the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the justification would be, well, the stakes are so high. The world is so mm-hmm. terrible. There are babies in cages. Trans people are dying. Uh, people are being deported. Uh, and it's like, well, those things are true, but they're also – they're worthy of discussion in an honest way. And, and those, and actually those things have always been true. <laughs> those things have always been true. We just didn't hear about them around the clock. Uh, and we did not, you know, we did not have video of every single thing that happened. We did not, every terrible thing in the world that happened, uh, we were much less likely to see. not that we see every terrible thing now, but, um, and and there's a lot of good that comes from the fact that we know so much more than we mm-hmm. used to. I would be the last one to sit here and say like, oh, it was much better when you know people couldn't whip out their cell phone cameras. But it was also, in a lot of ways, it was a lot better <laughs> when people couldn't whip out their their cell phone cameras. There's there's really like, you know, there there are going to be unintended consequences of of progress. So so I don't know, but yeah, the the idea that that we can't afford to have honest dialogue about complicated topics because uh, the stakes are too high or people are suffering or communities are being harmed. That to me is like bad faith reasoning. Let me bring in a sort of practical question from one of our members that's related to that. So um, this was from one of our book club participants um, regarding your overarching theme of the generational divide. How can we, whether we're instructors or researchers or perhaps public intellectuals, how can we acknowledge that young people are living in a different time with different perceived threats or perhaps those threats seem so much bigger because they're actually in our faces? Um, How can we acknowledge that while also fostering an understanding that societal gains have been made and that things are actually pretty good today? Well, I think that the way that question was, was phrased gets pretty close to the answer. You know, there are a lot of issues on on which I've really come around. I mean, something like these questions around sexual consent, affirmative consent, these kinds of, uh, these, these kinds of topics. There was a time maybe, you know, several years ago where I was much more cavalier about things like affirmative consent. Oh, well, that's silly. If you have to, you know, ask, can I, can I kiss you now? Can I touch you here? You know, every five seconds, that's, you know, that's shows some sort of lack of sophistication. You know, I think it's that stuff is very easy to make fun of. It's not nearly, I don't think it's quite, uh, quite as extreme as a lot of older people seem to think. But, you know, in thinking about all this stuff and, and reporting and talking to a lot of young people, it, it has become clear to me that they are dealing with an entire set of conditions on the on the sexual you know and, and social uh sort of kind of in those spheres that my generation didn't have to at all we didn't have ubiquitous online pornography we did not have um sexual expectations that had been set in place by you know really extreme uh just totally unrealistic <laughs> depictions of bodies <laughs> or desire uh we did not have uh, we did not assume that everyone we met romantically, we were going to meet online or on an app. We had a kind of intuitive sense of of social interaction. Uh, we knew what it was like to talk to somebody in real life. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing more uh, 
nothing requires more sort of unspoken intuition than negotiating an in-person sexual encounter. But if you've grown up on mostly communicating via screens, uh, you're not going to have those tools necessarily. So something like affirmative consent may make sense. Uh, and so that's an example of something where I've sort of come around. I, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, you guys just have to grow up. That's stupid. It's not really for me to say. Um, and I think, you know, some of the conversations around what what is assault and what is not, I, I think that that we do need to have some more discipline and kind of coherence around that. But yeah, um, I don't think a lot of people my age uh, teaching college, for instance, um, maybe they don't really think hard enough about the fact that like these kids are meeting strangers on Tinder and then having sexual experiences with them. Like I, I didn't really think of it until my students started describing this to me um, and that that would be like, they're young. That's a very early sexual experience. It's not like they're in their forties and doing this. They're 18. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's um, I think it's worth, it's worth thinking about. Yeah, so maybe just a little bit of taking their perspective um, on these issues. And then I, I guess how do you how can you take their perspective, but then also get them to see yours in some ways? Well, I mean, they have to see mine because I'm the teacher. <laughs> so they have to listen to me. Yes. Uh, I mean, the other thing, too, and I do think this is germane probably to a lot of a lot of the audience here is that you know, I, I teach writing and I'm always telling my students, you have to take risks. You have to say the unpopular thing. Otherwise, why are you doing it? It's your job as a writer to, to articulate the things that people are either unwilling or unable to articulate. Okay. But then my students will say to me, well, you know, that's easy for you to say because you have established yourself in in the time before social media, you're not going to get canceled on Twitter straight out of the gate. Um, and I think that that's a very good point. It was a tremendous gift to me as a, as a sort of public thinker, as a, as a, as a writer, as a person being published, it was a tremendous gift to not have to be looking over my shoulder constantly when I was a young writer and figuring things out. I mean, I wrote some, I published some pieces that like didn't make a lot of sense early in my career. <laughs> Most of them did because I had great editors and there was real editing going on at that time. And I was lucky enough to be writing for publications that had absolute top of the line editing and fact checking. And they didn't want to look stupid. So they didn't want their writers to look stupid. But you know, I had some misfires. And I didn't pay nearly the price that I would pay today for that kind of misfire. I mean, you can have your life wrecked over a tweet. Uh, imagine telling your student, well, don't worry about that. Go and write a 5,000 word essay that's going to provoke people and get over yourself. Eh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a tall order. Yeah, that is a really good point. It is much riskier today than it probably was 20 years ago. Yeah, I've wondered, is it possible to is it possible to say anything or write anything of consequence where people are going to like you or maybe be moved by something you said without also pissing people off? Like, can you only get positive feedback and not also trigger a lot of negative feedback? That's a great question. I often say nobody will love you unless somebody hates you. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I think you can write something nice and it's fine and people will like it. People won't care. Right? They won't remember it. Um, but I have found that uh, really you're not going to make a difference to readers if you don't take some risks. And the thing is like people read because they want to feel less alone. They want to feel connected to that author. They want that moment where they're like, Oh my God, I think that too. I thought I was the only one. And you can't achieve that unless you're being honest and you can't be honest uh, unless you're saying things that, you know, are not going to go down smoothly with everybody. So, uh, no, I mean, you, you have to take your hits. That's that's the job of the writer. And this gets into I have such a problem with the term brave. Like you see this all the time, especially in the personal essay arena. It's like, Oh, what a brave author. Oh, she's, she said this, you know, it's so, it's so bold of her. And I always say like, it's not brave. It's actually your job. 
Like stop calling it brave <laughs> because all you're doing is, is intimidating yourself. You're, you're, you're sort of setting yourself up to be afraid of this very thing you're saying. If, if you have decided that saying such a thing makes you brave, how about saying such a thing is showing up to work that day and doing your job <laughs> as a writer? Uh, so I think some some reframing might be in order on that score. Yeah, I like that. Um, so we're running out of time, but I'll uh, throw one more question in there for you. You said, I think toward the end of the book, um, that you can't fight tribalism with a tribe. Um, and this is something I've wondered about for a long time. Could you have a tribe that isn't united over an ideology and instead over some of the things you're talking about. So a desire for nuance, humility, giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, and of course, I'm thinking about Heterodox Academy and similar organizations or groups. Um, but if you have those kinds of groups, does that sort of inevitably lead to a kind of tribe where you can only view your group as good and any opposing groups as bad? And if that is the case, if that happens sort of necessarily is fighting against tribalism basically a losing battle because you're just going to have a bunch of solo individuals trying to take down this sort of organized beast of people with who are all supporting one another and have each other's backs? Yeah, um, that is a really important question. And I think you put it really well. I think Heterodox Academy is a great example of fighting that fight. I think that it's it's you you are fighting ideological uh, uh tribalism you're, you're you know you're you're for ideological diversity um and that's you know calling for diversity of thought is i think by definition not not tribal um but if you are an organization or a group of people saying our mission <laughs> our mission is is diversity of thought then i guess you could make the argument that that in and of itself is is a group so i mean this really turns into like just a sort of semantic math problem right does it not <laughs> um i guess what i what i would hope is that we're gonna get past this moment of really really damaging uh social media pylons and mob mentalities i mean it's interesting so we're talking now we're in the what second or third month of this pandemic i mean i'm i'm noticing just in the last week or so the vitriol on Twitter, uh, especially social media generally, but especially on Twitter, has just reached peak. It's people are just bloodthirsty. They are, you know, every day there's a new victim, um, and they are. Are we shot bored? Is that the problem? <laughs> they're bored. They're frustrated. We're doing. I mean, I'm guilty of it. Like I could go outside and take a walk, but why am I just scrolling on Twitter? It's it's pathetic. Um, the schadenfreude, the, the reveling and seeing other people go down. I mean, I've been dragged on Twitter a couple times over the last few months um, over just silly things. Uh, and like, I, I, and I notice it in myself. Like I've, I, you know, I, I'll see something happen to somebody else and I'll say, oh my gosh, well, at least that wasn't me. Uh, and so I, I guess what I'm saying is that I think, I hope that things will get so bad that everyone kind of realizes that it's not sustainable and that we can't live in a culture where the reward system is such that saying the obvious thing um, will not only give you a dopamine hit, but improve your career, get you more likes, get you more followers, get you more fame, potentially get you a job. Uh, if the reward, if, if that is rewarded more than saying the honest thing or the necessary thing, and in fact, saying the necessary thing is penalized, uh, we are not going to solve like really urgent problems. I don't think we can have, uh, I, I'm not even sure we can solve the health crisis without, actually, I know we can't. We can't, we're not going to actually come out of this if we can't have honest conversations about how to handle it, where it came from, how to keep it from happening again. Um, and a lot of people don't even want those conversations to happen because they can too easily like, drift into something that will look on some level like xenophobia or um you know giving too much leverage to the enemy sort, sort of thing and and that's just you know as eric weinstein says you know let me know when you're ready to sit at the grown-ups table that's just not a sophisticated <laughs> way 
of of analyzing reality or talking about reality. And so I'm hoping that people will will realize that the current mode of discourse is just not sustainable. Um, it's not only damaging to us emotionally as a culture, but it's not productive and it's in fact counter counterproductive. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on today, Megan. Thank you, Corey. It was fun. You can follow Megan on Twitter at Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N underscore Daum, D-A-U-M. You can find a link to her book in the show notes, and our book club discussion guide will be available on Heterodox Academy's tools and resources page. If you have any comments, you can contact me at Clark at heterodoxacademy.org or on Twitter at I'm Hard Corey, A-M-H-A-R-D-C-O-R-Y. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. If you like Heterodox Academy, please consider becoming a member or a friend of HXA, telling your open-minded colleagues and friends about us, or making a donation. Thanks for listening. This podcast is produced by Heterodox Academy. Find us online at heterodoxacademy.org, on Twitter at HDX Academy, and on Facebook. This podcast is for informational purposes only and doesn't represent the views of Heterodox Academy.